Hi, my name is Erin Wing, and I am Deputy Director of Investigations with Animal Outlook. I am here with Victor Kosakowski, Director of the beautiful and poignant film Gunda, a breakout hit documentary that follows a mother sow, as well as multiple cows and chickens. I'm very fortunate to have the pleasure of interviewing him and hope to learn more about the film that seems to remind us of the inherent value of life and the significance of all animal consciousness. Hello, Victor. Thank you for taking the time for this and it's an honor to speak with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, and for your uh, interest. Yeah, so I had the privilege of watching Gunda not too long ago. And I just wanted to say how almost therapeutic it was to me in a way as a former undercover investigator for animal cruelty. But the imagery of the animals living their lives without serving humans is very healing to me. After working and um, doing investigations for two years and then retiring, I spend a lot of my time at the local farm sanctuary here. And I just like to continue to have some type of direct positive interactions with animals. So when I go to volunteer, sometimes I like to stop and just listen to the sounds of nature and the animals at peace. And I feel like that film just embodies that feeling. So I'm very curious about the thought processes behind creating something that depicts that feeling so well. So can I ask, what, what, what was the vision and how did the project come about? You know, many years ago, I was like 30 years ago, I was filming another movie in the, in the, in the countryside. And, and close to the place I was filming, I saw fire, big, big fire. So all my team, we, we, we ran there and we saw, uh, it was end of Soviet era and it was actually last year. And it was the year when Soviet Union disappeared, but still it was collective, collective agriculture uh, facilities. It was kind of burn, burn for hundred cows. And cows themselves, they were on the field, but the, the, this, this big, huge burn was in fire. And it was not possible to stop it. We were trying to stop it, <clears throat> no hope, no hope. But then, then I listened something behind me. It was like moo, moo. The, the, cow, the cows, they came back to their home and they did not find home. And then, all in that part of Russia um, during in the summer there is white night so you see all night there is no sun is always present so sun never goes behind the horizon so you can always see light all night cows was walking on the ashes and like moo, moo, they were so like confused what happened to their house <laughs> they least used to live in that house all life and suddenly it was gone, it's gone. So it was obviously they, they have conscious. It was obviously for me that they kind of, they don't know what to do. They, they, it was just same what would what we would feel if our house burned, you know, it just totally, for me was clear that they have emotions and intellect. And I always knew it since I was a kid. So when I was a kid, I four years old, I had a little piglet friend, Vasya. I was four, he was one month. Uh, I was four years, he was one month old. So of course he was eaten by my relatives. And this drama for me changed all my life. I wouldn't, I, I could not imagine eating meat anymore. So, and this step by step, step by step, I, I this project like grow inside me step by step, day by day, then filming in different films. I always noticed that all my films full of animals and people always were asking me, why so many animals in your film? And why they kind of have equal, equal part in the films, all this. 
and yeah, it's it was kind of natural for me to focus on animals. And in '97, I already wanted to make this particular film, and I call it Trinity, like not mythological Trinity, like Godfather, God Son, Spirit, but <clears throat> real Trinity. Uh, but it was not possible to find money. So, but now I guess, I guess time changed and people people start uh, people still think about it. You know, the, uh, the fact that I found money after 30, 20 years, I finally found a person who trusts me and find institution, Norwegian Film Institute, who gave us money and producer he in Norway and in the US who decided to produce the film. So it, it means something happening here. And, like, and the, the response I have, now film started in few countries and respond everywhere, so amazing. So it means people, be, was, people were ready to face such movies. You know, people, people in this, I don't know. You know, we, we live in a time when everyone have dog at home, right? Everyone has pets, and and for me it's crazy why people don't make this simple link. So they 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 totally show that their pet is clever, sensitive, feels the emotions, understands them, friendly, like and like really best friend, right? And they cannot make a link that cow or chicken or pig. Could be same, <laughs> could be totally same. They, can, they simply cannot understand it, and this for me always was amazing. I don't know. Yeah, probably it was most important for me to make this film as a pure human and as filmmaker. I knew I must do it, and <laughs> once we like a few years ago, we were crossing ocean for another project. And it was a huge storm, biggest in hundred years. And storm hurricane took us inside the Atlantic. And we were just one boat in all Atlantic. And two weeks, we was not able to go out from this. And waves were 20 meters around, high around us. And everyone was afraid. And I said, don't worry, we didn't make animal film yet. <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it. So. And he did it, he did it. And it's amazing that you were able to do that because I can definitely see this film contributing to um, broadening people's awareness of animals. And it's such a great film. Um, so I'm really glad that you were able to make it and you were able to get out of that storm. Yeah, <laughs> you're right, you're right, yeah. <clears throat> And I also privileged that, you know, in Europe we learn how to make films, but we don't know how to distribute films. So uh, that's the fact that uh, Phoenix uh, uh, support the film, the fact that Neon bought the film and want to distribute it, it's such a big step in my career because I made many films let's say they were not bad but no one saw them because we now have to make movies but we really not good with distribution and in europe so it's kind of i wouldn't say we're too modest but we don't have this culture to say my product my film my product or oh, my film is really great watch it it cannot say it it's just kind of uh, we so, and especially if it's so delicate subject, you know, when you can, for example, I, yeah, uh, I, I'm, do, I'm doing an interview in every country now in many, many countries in Europe and always say, people say to me, say something, invite people to, to watch your film. And I, I, I like, I have shame to say something like, and I only say, go watch it. And I promise you, you're gonna be a tiny bit happier. <laughs> this is only I can say, <laughs> but it's true in a way, right? Because um, we we need some remedy for our soul, you know. You know, just to have something. Uh, otherwise, it's I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. That I mean, as I said earlier, it it is a therapeutic. For, for myself and mm. for other people as well. 
Um, you mentioned just the uh, technical aspect of just making a film and then having the difficulty of getting it out there. And I wanted to ask uh, this next question that might get a bit technical, but I was wondering if you could give a little insight on how you filmed Gunda and what made you decide to have no music in the film or audio aside from the animals' noises, of course. You know, film filmmaking is a huge, powerful tool, right? So as we know, filmmaker can convince you to choose a particular president, convince you to buy a particular product, convince you to, to believe in something, you know, it's, it's manipulation tool. It's a manipulation tool. And cinema is strong manipulation tool. I always believe it's a gun. It's a machine gun. So you can really make huge impact in a way. So it, this is why the, the, the trust what we have in the image, it's devaluated. I mean, is it correct word devaluate? I mean, it used to be that image is a document, not anymore. Now when it's in the screen, you see, you see people without legs, but you know it's a good actor. He he is he is normally with legs, but in the film he is without legs, right? So the value of image is totally different than before. Before, if you saw something, it was like, wow, it's real, it's real, and you trust it. And this is why I made, especially with editing, with editing, you can you can convince people that, I don't know, whatever you want, like Christus came again, just smoke Marlboro came back to the sky, you know, you, I can make it, you know, and you will say, oh, you know, it, it just, this is why uh, I said, no, 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 I will not use any manipulation tool. I will not edit fast. I will not use voiceover. I will use black and white, very long shots, almost no editing, especially last shot. If I will edit this shot in the end, in the end, if, if I will make a more intense cut and more push emotions, maybe it will work for first weekend, but not for, for lo forever, not forever. People will say, oh, it's a movie, come on, it's a movie. So, but now you see it's real. I did not do anything. I did not push you. I did not manipulate. And this is, uh, you know, like I made last film, a uh, couple of films before I made one movie and it was so dramatic water flow in Argentina. It was all, all huge, huge piece of land was totally covered by water and and two people staying on the little island and they look around and one of them said, wow, it looks like, uh, it looks unbelievable. And then I say, yeah, it looks like metaphor, but it's just, it's simply just truth. Nothing else. It looks like metaphor, but it's just simple truth. And this is what's important, right? It's, a, it's not, it, it is like a piece of art, this movie, but on the top of it, it just shows. And she is suffering. When we took her kids, she is suffering like hell. As everyone, human will suffer if someone will take his kids, right? And they experience freedom same way as we would do, right? Because they are cows, they are almost dancing, right? They almost, they, they're happy. And, and chickens, they, they, they saw first time sky and first time they touch grass. And you see in their eyes like, wow, what is this? Right? So it would be the same with us, right? So, and it's a very banal idea that we are, even those, this idea stays with us a few thousand years already since Greek and since, since Bible. And Greek was saying, human is a measure of everything. Oh, why? <laughs> why measure of everything is human? Why? What? A, what a, and in Bible was written, that human came in the day five to rule all of this. Why? 
it's, 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 it's stupid mistakes, you know, and people believe it and people don't even question, right? So, no, it's, it's time to question. Time to question banal uh, things and say, oh, 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 wait a second. Why my life is more important than life of animals? Why? Who said that if they, if they came to the planet before us, why we have to choose <laughs> to live or for them to live or not to live or to be pregnant or to be pregnant, <laughs> to, to be captivated in the cage or not? Why we are so arrogant and why we dominating this point? I don't understand. It's a mistake we are doing and we, unfortunately, we're going to pray. And I believe because nature, how long nature will take us? You know, there is a famous story. I don't know if you know this. There is a famous story. I will not name the country. I don't want to have any international scandal, but you probably know this. In one country was... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, people notice that um, birds are eating um, uh, berries in their garden. And this was simple birds, which everywhere, like spore, come the gray one, little ones, they live every every city. It's, how do you call it? Spar, spar. Uh, most popular one in these cities, the little gray bird. What is special, yeah, I forgot the name of them in English, but what is special about them? They cannot fly long. They always have to, every two minutes they have to land. So in that country, people decided, why don't we kill them? And they did like this. They started just make a plow. And birds was not able to land because they were afraid of this sound. And in five minutes, they will start falling because they were not able to fly longer. And they died. Unfortunately, two months later, all agriculture was eaten by uh, insects. Insects came and, you see, to protect their uh, uh, garden from, uh, like, their berries from birds, they killed birds, but then insect came and it had everything, you know. This is the big surprise, right? But it's so simple. Everything has meaning here. Everything, nature for a million years make it in harmony. If you go outside of city and you look around when there is no people, first what you say, oh, wow, how beautiful. <laughs> Why is it? Because there are no people there. <laughs> That's why <laughs> we did not destroy it yet. <laughs> I always, you know, when mm, Phoenix told me, we were talking about this Phoenix recently, and, and uh, something we were talking about Mars, and because Elon Musk, Musk wants to go to Mars, and someone asked him, if, what, if you go, what would one thing you can take with you? Someone say, I take book, someone say, I take. Uh, photo of my kid, someone said, and I said, the only thing we have to take if we go there, only one, empathy, empathy. If we go there without empathy, we will destroy Mars the same as we do here, right? This is the so like this, you know? otherwise why we go there? To, to do what? <laughs> to do same hell as we do here. <laughs> no, no, no. Absurd, absurd. Yeah, I totally agree that um, I I understand the need to explore other places in the universe and the galaxy, but I am wholeheartedly of the mindset that you know we need to figure out how to take care of the planet that we're already on before exploring other ones. There's definitely a lot of issues here, um, but to return back to Earth and uh, just to address uh, Gunda again, um, I was just wondering how long did it take to get all the footage? And you mentioned that it was not edited in any way. It was um, just the raw footage. Um, I'm wondering if that's correct because um, 
you know, for example, with uh, undercover investigations, after we finish them, we always give the all the raw footage to law enforcement, um, but we present it to, to the public and we cut it everything down so that it's in a uh, digestible format for the public to easily just watch three minutes of it, um, which, you know, someone could be at a particular factory farm site for three months, six months, and then it's cut down to just three minutes so that people can pay attention. So um, for, for me, I, I consider undercover investigators like amateur filmmakers, where we film what the animals are going through when they're suffering. Um, and I feel like I have a sort of connection with how Gunda is filmed, where it's just you witnessing the animals and documenting them, but not interfering. So I'm wondering if, um, is, is anything cut down in any way? And is it, is it different from how long it actually took to get the footage itself? You know, normally in such situation, this is most, uh, normally when you film animals, you film a lot because behavior of animals are unpredictable. You don't know what might happen, where they go, left or right. You, you simply don't know. This is why um, before I start filming, I study a lot. And uh, I, I talk to scientists. For example, there is a great one in Brazil uh, who studied them for 20 years, pigs. And the last years, he was, he was filming them 24-7 camera was filming them day and night. So he sent me a lot of material to watch. And so I knew more or less everything, how the mentality, I understood the mentality, I understood the uh, uh, normal hab habits, right? So I knew, uh, that's why we only film six hours. We only film six hours. and. In my view, I would even show six hours, but I know people do not like to watch long movies, you know, it's, uh, and that's why I made 90 minutes because it's kind of traditional format for, for cinema release. So, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very old filmmaker from old school. So, I mean, I start filming in 35 millimeter in, in Soviet Union, and we didn't have a lot of footage, just we didn't have it. So for, for my first film, I made my first film one hour long, and I only have one hour of footage. So I didn't have much, my, like, sometimes I made three times more than I need, sometimes four, but not, not really a lot. As, for documentary, sometimes at the moment, they film 100 times more than they use. But I have this uh, practice experience of filming very little. So I knew what I need. I'm just able to wait. I'm able to wait. I'm able to do not touch anymore. I'm able to, what I do before filming, I, I read a lot and I, spend time with Gunda. I came to her before she gave birth. So we became friends before she gave birth. So I was coming every morning, four o'clock in the morning, waiting when she wakes up. Then she came to me, she smelled me, she looked at me. So I spent a day with her, then one week with her, a week before she gave birth. So when she gave birth, she already knew me, she already trusted me, she already was not scare of my presence and and when kids appear they kind of accept us me and my team as part of the family so it was not a big deal and then of course we use some secrets we we invented kind of similar house to her original house but with possibilities that we are not inside but only lens inside only not even camera inside but only lens inside. Lens is inside of the, on the barn and camera and people, we all outside. So 
in a way, we did not disturb her life. We did not. We, we just, we were just calmly and patient, two months waiting what happened. We knew we are, what we are looking for. And uh, that's why it was not necessity to film a lot. Not a necessity. And that's why editing was, editing of animals, which are growing very difficult to, to edit wrongly because they are growing fast. So in the first, in one frame, they're little. Tomorrow, they're bigger. After tomorrow, they're bigger. So you simply cannot, you have no chance even to put it differently because you, people, if they watch films, they will say, hey, 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 wait a second. They were like this, why is they now like this, you know? So that's why editing is in a way difficult, but in a way very simple, because you don't have chance to edit difficult. You don't have chance to edit complicated. They just grow and you just follow this simple timeline. They grow, period. So that's why it was easy, easy filming and easy editing, very simple. It's easiest film I ever done because mostly because I noticed um, how my team is changing. So uh, I noticed for me it was easy. I never had meat in my life since age four, but for them, I noticed that one by one, they come into in the evening to the restaurant and they're uh, do you have anything vegetarian? <laughs> do you have anything vegan? <laughs> Suddenly, all my team became normal, or like I would say normal. <laughs> Sorry for this term, but they, so they understood it. Because if you, if you, so, and we, we were happy every day, you know, when you, when you're in close contact with animals and they trust you, even chicken not run away from you. This is because normally if you if you with chicken, they will run if you do wrong step, right? So but they were not running from us. So they accept us, you know, they they we were gentle, we were careful, and we dedicate our time to them, and that's why it's good result, you know. They expect us. And also important is some of the footage made in the farms and some of them made in sanctuaries. And in sanctuaries, animals behave different totally because they know that people are nice creatures. <laughs> yeah, animals know that people are nice creatures. They trust, they don't, they don't run, they don't put you on the horn, even they are huge, you know. <laughs> so because they, they know people are nice. So so in sanctuaries, it's a pleasure to film animals. They they're friendly, they're just they are easy to communicate. And even you come with huge steady cam and huge professional equipment camera, no problem for them. They trust you. Yeah. This is why, for example, my cow in the film, the portrait of cows, they are very old, which normally you don't see them. In in the farm, in production farm, you never see old car. If because old car is already in slaughtery house. But in sanctuaries, car could be 20 years or more. So this is why it's so beautiful because it's just so, you see life behind your eyes. Yeah, I um, when you mentioned that, I just thought of uh, cows I have interacted with um, during my career as an undercover investigator. And I investigated two different dairy factory farms and they definitely realized who is kind to them and who is not. Um, because I did form a friendship with one cow and her tag number was 714. And I remember her, she was my friend. And uh, I met her in the back of the milking area. And that was before they would go in and get milked. And that was where a lot of the abuse would happen at that facility. And I pet her a couple of times. And ever since then, she would come back and, and look for me. And it, it was like she knew that I was the only one there who would give her affection. So I definitely agree that they're aware of you know who is nice to them. They have that, you know, they're they're not very different from us. And then again with their differences, uh, we can learn to celebrate those differences as well. 
Um, I know you mentioned uh, the chickens and I'd like to ask about the chickens shown in the film uh, because the scene where the chickens are stepping out of the cage for the first time was just really symbolic to me and how long it took them to realize that just a simple push of the gate would open it and allow them to be free. It's a good question. It's a good question. It took them a lot, almost one hour before they came out almost one hour and only one came out and the others were not still able to, they were still afraid. And then second one came out and came back. And it was, I actually even wanted to use this in the film, but it makes this episode much longer and even kind of political. And I didn't want to have this element of um is it, it, it to understand that she came back you need like five minutes to look and it's this balance all all temperate of the movie so i knew if i keep it it will be interesting from uh, many points of view but movie itself will be destroyed but it was fascinating uh, moment because they were afraid they used to live in this cage all life and kind of they don't know you can go out. They simply cannot go. Do you know this famous, um, famous, maybe you saw experiment. I don't know, every time I say famous experiment, I, I, I feel wrong because again, we are making experience with, with animals or, or insects. It's, it's, all, or it's already wrong. But there is a quite famous when, uh, when you know these insects or mosquitoes were cap covered by glass, and they flying inside glass for long, and then people took glass, and mosquitoes were flying exactly in the same perimeter, and not going because they, they, still, they still believe they're inside glass. Even you took glass, they still did not cross borders. So yeah, and it's, it's, and it's also very political, you know, because this is, if you look to my country, for example, right? So it's, um, Soviet Union collapsed, Soviet empire collapsed 30 years ago. We made one step out and we came back to the cage, very simply. And now we have same cage as used to be in Soviet Empire. Now it's Russian Empire, but same cage. We were afraid to go out. We were afraid to, to experience freedom and we turned back to prison. And when I speak to my friends in Russia, I say, how is it possible? How you can live in prison? They say, cage is big, chain is long. <laughs> you see, it's a, this is how it is. Yeah. yeah. But of course, yeah. Of course, go, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say I completely agree. And it just the way that you spoke to how deeply exploitation affects anyone, human or animal, and how you can carry around that prison in your mind. And it takes a lot of healing to free yourself. And I feel like you were able to um, explore that, what the chickens were experiencing in that um, within the film. So- You I'm know, yeah, you know, if, if you, The story is, of course, if you're making such film, you want to go to Slaughtery House and you want to film, or you want to film, have horrible conditions animals live in prisons and almost like concentration camps. But I noticed those films doesn't work. I mean, they do not touch the, the, the most important thing, the personalities of animals. This is most important. 
to accept that they are not something, but someone, each of them, each of them. And this is most difficult for us. We know we kill them, but we block, we block our mind not to think about it. This is most difficult to, to fight. Listen, we always were saying, oh, we are better because we kill them because we are clever. But we, they're also clever. We, 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 we kill them because we have emotion and they don't have emotion. But look, in Gunda, they do have emotions, right? Or we say, we, we use symbols, we say. We, are, we can be artists and they don't. I'm sorry, it's not correct. They use symbols and I can prove it. So it's everything, it's everything is, excuse me for my language, it's everything bullshit what we say. It's just to justify our cruelty. We invented things, not any animal invented. We invented concentration camp. We invented torturing, gun machine, a nuclear bomb, Novichok. We invented horrible, horrible things. And animals did not. Animals did not. Animals did not buy for pleasure, and we do. We make valiera hot, uh, valier hunting. Yeah, we just we put animals in the block space. We come in with huge carabine rifles with good lens and for pleasure. Who might who? And now we say we are better. We are better than them. And even you say, some people say they also kill. Yeah, they kill sometimes if they need, and but with the, with the risk to be killed. If lion want to kill bull, lion knows he can be killed by bull as well, right? But we, we are killing by billions, by billions. Did you see numbers of 2020? 1.5 billion pigs were killed by 2020. 66 billion chicken. What exactly we are doing? How is it even possible? No, I just, um, anyone, listen, how we talk about coronavirus? Even this fact is wrong. We say coronavirus came, you have to fight with it. Excuse me, we came, not coronavirus. Coronavirus was here all the time, sleeping. Before we were born, viruses were here living. Water was here always and viruses. Then we came and we did something wrong and we woke up viruses and they mutate because of our wrong behavior. No, we don't want to see it. We just see them as animals, uh, enemies. But who, who is guilty? We are guilty. It's absurd, absurd. I, I don't understand. I really don't understand us. We, uh, I don't know. I hope one day we'll understand. People will understand it. You know, I, I, I want to write, do you know this quote of Leonardo da Vinci? I want to write it every building in the planet. <laughs> because he said it 500 years ago. To kill animal, to kill human, is just act of killing. Same. Absolutely same. Same value. Act of killing. Nothing else. And we allow ourselves to be cruel, to torture them, to mistreat them, and to kill them. And this is what we do with our life. Because we, we allow ourselves to be cruel and even play that we are not guilty. We don't say to our kids that you are eating now animals we just killed the other day. We don't say, we just, we say to them, eat, eat, eat. It is, it's, uh, for me, it's easier to say because I am 60 years old. 
And H4, I stop eating meat. H4. So 56 years, I never ate meat. And I'm healthy. And my kids born, one thirty-three, another eighteen. Never ate any any animal, any fish, any any bird, none. And they're healthy. So for me, it's easy to say, it's garbage. If people tell you, you have to eat meat. Look to the horse. Look to the horse. Horse is just power. And vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> um it's interesting that you mentioned that you know it's not the animals who are you know, making these wars and causing a lot of the issues that affect our planet and it's funny because i have a brother who's 18 and he's just trying to figure out his place in the world and how to you know interact with the world and i told him you know if you really want to understand the way that you should be look at our family dog and watch him watch how he spends his days watch what he does because he's doing things the right way um, and you learn a lot from animals they don't ever take as much as they need to and i told him all this they don't you don't see monkeys causing you know monkey wars where they go to other countries and take over you know monkey <laughs> villages you don't see them doing that so exactly. Exactly. learn from, just take a look because we can learn a lot from each other, not just humans, just all of us. Can learn from each other. But actually we, learn, we, we took everything from them. We use helicopters or airplanes. How did we make them? Because Leonardo started drawing wings of birds. Leonardo da Vinci started drawing wings of birds, studied them, and now we use helicopters and airplanes. We, uh, whales can communicate in thousand kilometers distance without GPS, without email. <laughs> Birds fly from Europe to Africa every season and then come back in Gibraltar. They cross in uh, Mediterranean in one particular place. How do they know? How do they know? What is it? They know. They don't have compass. They don't have GPS. No iPhone. They know, right? Trees communicating even without roots connecting. Trees, if you put scientists, what they do now, fantastic. They, again, they, they make experiment, experiments, unfortunately. But this is so beautiful experience in a way that you probably can change our mentality. Scientists can put special, like kind of back to the leaf of the tree, like insect. And that tree will produce liquid against this insect. But another tree, which is in a thousand meter distance, will produce same liquid against this particular insect. How? How this tree gave information to that one? We don't know. We don't know. Do you know this? Do you know that what we want to have? We want to live long, right? Tree can live 1,000 years. Shark in Greenland can live 700 years. We want to live without arthritis, without Alzheimer without all illness which comes to us when we are old. This is what our goal, right? As a human race, right? Excuse me, crocodile already have it. Crocodile already have it. Crocodile, if you see that crocodile, he fight, he, for example, he died in a fight with another crocodile. You opened his body, and you will not find any simple, any, any sign of his age. He might be 10 years, maybe 100, no one knows. He doesn't have any arthritis, Alzheimer, none, none. He already have what we just want. We just dreaming to have the body which 
and how we do it. <laughs> changing body, it's changing what we take. We take from kidney from uh, from pig <laughs> and and heart from part of heart from pig and put to implant to our body. And this is what we do. So it's ridiculous. We are ridiculous hypocrites. We all talking about hell, about planet, about global warming, about climate change. And what we do? We eat animals. Stop talking about them. Stop talking about planet. If you want to talk about planet, stop with me. Stop kill animals. Stop produce animals and stop, don't touch anyone, don't touch anyone. <laughs> they can live without you, they don't touch you, right? Look, I, I, always, I always think like this. You know, sometimes once in a while, like once in five years, shark eat someone on the beach, right? Maybe in America, maybe in Australia, maybe in somewhere. Accidentally shark cut like maybe a leg or, and what happened next? army of people <laughs> with rifles, with helicopters, attack this shark and kill you, right? Excuse me, we are killing over a trillion fish every year. And what fish do? They don't do anything to us. They accept it. And if she, if, if one of the sharks cut legs of, from human, Wow, all civilization will fight and find this shark and kill. And then what we do? We kill them and we make selfie. <laughs> you know, we, we go to Africa, we kill elephant and we make selfie. Even kings, even kings that do, does it. King does this. They, king, so, you know, this big scandal is king of one of European country. Well, came to Africa to kill animal and make pictures. Presidents do this. They go to Russian forest, they kill bear and they make a picture on the top of it. They go to uh, Siberia and kill tiger and they make photos how they kill tiger. What is this? So, so next presidents of any country is supposed to be not the one who knows how to rule country in an economical way. Next one supposed to know, instead of cutting trees, planting trees, instead of, instead of killing everyone, let them be, you know? I don't know, I just, I just don't understand what we are doing. And, when I say planting trees, I, I found myself that I'm wrong. Because even planting trees, you're changing the ecology of the health system, right? So we rather to first, before we change anything, we rather to learn how to respect it. We have to respect it in a way it is. And take a break and say, we don't do anything. Let's look. Let's look around. Where is our simple, modest place to be? Not to destroy anything, not to change anything, because it has harmony without us. And our duty is not to destroy it, not to destroy it. But we want to dominate, unfortunately. This is how we, this is how it, this is how we get our defamation, you know? <laughs> it's pleasure. Yeah, so in the interest of um, what you mentioned of just leaving animals to be and that they are aware of what they should do and what they want to do and we should refrain from interfering, I wanted to address um, the scene in the documentary where Gunda uh, steps on the weakest of her babies. And you said before that you made the conscious decision to not turn the cameras off. It seems like that would be very upsetting uh, for some people to see, but I personally appreciated the chance that you gave to Gunda to accurately depict her reality. And was it your intention to follow in line with 
refraining from having that human interference in the film, having that carry over into your respecting her decisions, knowing that she was aware of what she was doing and was wise enough to make those hard decisions for herself? You know, every film, every film, filmmaker is making such choice because if I will film anyone, I might film something not, for example, someone might film about me. 90 minutes film, 10 years ago, someone was following me one year and made film about me. In my contract was written that I can delete three episodes and delete 15 phrases if I don't like. And my first reaction when I saw film was, okay, I have to delete this, 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 because it's kind of compromised me. But then I said, hey, wait a second, wait a second. Is it true? Yes. Why do you have to delete it? What is the, what is the purpose to make me nicer or more clever or what is the purpose to do? I'm like it is, and period. This is my way to be, and there is a person on the screen looks like me. It's not me. <laughs> it's person look like me. That's true. So, and I cannot judge Gundo. She's she's million years older than me, like pigs. Pigs here much before us. They have their way to be, and she knows why she did it. Might be I can guess that she knew that she has only 10 nipples active. She knew that she wouldn't have enough milk for everyone. And she knew that this one is weak one. And she will, that, that weakest one will not make it. She knew. And before she did it, she smelled him seven times. And then she killed him. So, and I cannot judge her because why I would. Of course, when I edit her, I can either cut it out, but then again, then I am making kind of idealized image of Gunda and kind of propaganda, vegan propaganda film. I don't want to say she is better than us. I am just saying she is like this and she has the right to be here, period. I'm not saying she is better than human, no. She's not God, she's not angel, she's like this, but she has right to be here, you like it or not. And this is a simple point, right? Simple, it's and stupid to, that's why for me it was no question to use it or not to use it. I decided to use it. And I do appreciate you leaving that in. Again, uh, I feel like it's just, the most accurate way of allowing her to tell her story. So I do appreciate that you did decide to um, leave that content in. Um, I did want to um, continue along, along the lines of um, addressing the pigs shown in your documentary. There's that final scene with the piglets being taken away that really struck a chord with me as it was like I had seen them from birth in the film and watched them grow. And by the end of the film, I think I can say that I loved them. And so that final scene, for me, it was heartbreaking, but something I also expected in a way, because uh, you stated before that you believe that when Gunda's babies are taken from her and by one could only presume was a farmer off screen, you've mentioned that you believe she looked to you, you and your camera crew for help. And I know how that feels after my experience doing a dairy investigation not too long ago, where I found two dead calves on the farm. And um, this was at a dairy factory farm. And, and I witnessed two mother cows were sniffing the dead bodies of the babies. And then they looked at me while I was filming them and they were asking for my help in a way. And then they cried out when I didn't move because they 
knew that there was nothing I could do. And I knew that I, there was nothing I could do. Uh, so the feeling I know is heartbreaking. Um, it's a heartbreaking feeling. And I'm wondering, of course, that must have been a difficult experience for uh, you and your camera crew. Yeah, they, they, they're young people, right? So they're from 25 to 35. They're from seven different countries. And, uh, and suddenly during this episode, I, I, I listen, they're crying behind me because it was so huge, huge moment. Like um, it's in a way privilege to, filmmaking is a privilege because you can, you can see truth of life. And it's sometimes it's such a big truth that you, you can't handle it, you, 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 you cry. And, and specifically when she came to us and she looked at us and she obviously say, what, why, why are you doing this? And, and, but most difficult one for me was her last look before she went to, the, to, to her door and disappeared. Because she, she kind of look in a way that you are hopeless, guys. There is no way. There is nothing I can tell you because what you are hopeless. It was obviously she said to me, "If you cannot help me, you are hopeless," and she left. So it was such a penalty, you know, like. Her, her speech was so obvious and so powerful and so painful to listen, you know. Ah, we were frozen, we were frozen. We were totally were frozen and crying, all of us, because it just, because it's, it's like, you know, it's not you only. It's tradition of almost 8 billion people. Eight billion people behind you doing this every day. We are talking one hour, right? <laughs> With you. It's about 150,000 pigs were killed during one hour. This is what reality. In one day, we will kill four million pigs. In one single day, every day. This is reality. So um, this is reality, unfortunately. So and have to have to. My 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 second title was apology. No one then producer say no 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 we cannot use type apology. No one will go towards this field. But the truth is. It's apology because I, I know I cannot change the world. I, I know I cannot convince people. I know maybe I will convince most sensitive one, the few, the few, but I will not convince everyone. I know. So. Yes, I've um, noticed that in previous interviews you've done about Gunda that you said that you we're thinking about calling the film your apology or that you have called the film your apology. And I just wanted to say, I, I, I identify with that um, a lot as I felt personally a tremendous guilt after retiring from doing undercover investigations um, because I knew that I wasn't physically there documenting things. And it's a different type of feeling when you are dedicating yourself to trying to do as much as you can for these animals and knowing that as much as you can do. Uh, for me, I feel like it'll never be enough. That's why I go to farm sanctuaries and I volunteer and I, I try to still do things for the animals knowing that, you know, I don't know if it'll ever be enough, but it's good that we, we can do the things that we do because it, it can make a difference. And just like your film, I'm sure will definitely make a difference in the minds of a lot of people. Let's hope, let's hope. Um, I, I did want to ask about um, just your decision to keep that in the film and 
and the way that uh, there could be some so-called negative emotions that arise from these types of scenes and that uh, there's an entanglement with being, uh, if you are watching the film as an animal rights advocate or someone who uh, loves animals, we like to um, exclusively focus on the positive knowing that there's so much negative because it can be very tiring um, thinking about all of the negative that is there. Um, so having the piglets being taken away at the end, um, I can understand how it could make people upset. And it seems like happiness seems to be the default correct emotion in our society. But I, I do want to address the, the fact that you include the negative and positive emotions uh, that go into a relationship that we have with, with the animals in the film. And I think that's important. And your film didn't seem to shy away from embracing all aspects of the lives of these animals as they exist in this world with us. I, I wanted to know, um, how did you decide to document a working farm and sanctuary footage? And what was your process on figuring out how to balance the two in, within the film? Yeah, uh, the story is, uh, Yeah, I, I, you, you know, when you do movie in professional way, you always have to, you have to always know the form is important, maybe more important than content, because actually they must be in harmony. If, if something in unbalance, then you don't. If, for example, if content is more important than form, then it's not art anymore. It's kind of or it's propaganda, or it's newspaper, or it's just journalism, or journalist, or so. And if it's form more important than subject, then it's just um, poor act and, uh, and um, will not make impact in big audience. So that's why, of course, I wanted to make more and more and more, but I also know I have to keep it in the same form and shape. So when first we filmed Yunda episode and uh, in the script idea, in the beginning when we develop idea, I thought it will be equal three episodes, like 30 minutes each. But when we first filmed Yunda episode and Gunda was already 60 minutes episode, I understood even 66 minute episodes. I, I understood I cannot do much. I, I cannot do equal episodes of cow and, and chicken. So, so I knew that I have to find different form to shape it together and to, to make it in a way that people watch it and not to, because if it's boring film, then you are losing the audience, right? People are not going to watch it. So then I, then I noticed that piglets, they, they grow mostly during the night. So every morning I was coming back, I saw they're growing fast. No, I mean, you, you, you obviously see they're bigger every morning. During the day, you don't see it. But every morning you came back and they're they coming out from house. Oh they're bigger, <laughs> they're bigger every day. So, and I said, okay, it means I can, in the moment they go to sleep, I can, I can, I can include another element of the film. For example, uh, when they sleep, you can hear like, mm, I, I don't know, or, or if they, before they wake up, you can see like rooster. So, so farms is always like this, animals are around, right? So it's easy to, but I also knew I cannot make it long. So I knew I have to make powerful 10 minutes episode, each of cow and chicken. And that's why I, I thought, okay, I will do something very emotional, what, what normally people don't see. And, mm, um, not storytelling way, but just give emotion. Could be one shot, but emotional. Could be one episode, but emotional. 
actually is filmmaking is wrongly described as storytelling. In my opinion, it's a mistake because um, you know, for example, if you travel, let's go, let's say, where did you travel last time? I can't remember when, because with everything going on, I haven't traveled lately. Okay, okay. Let's say you go to Paris. Have you been in Paris? I would love to go to Paris one day. Ah, have you been in Roma? No. no. Okay. Have you been in St. Petersburg? No? Okay. All right. Okay. Believe me, if you go to, I don't know, Niagara, have you been in Niagara? Waterfall? No. Only this country I've traveled in. Okay. Now you will be there. Okay. I will tell you what you experience. Now you will be in Waterfall. You will say, ah, oh. that's what you will say. You will go to St. Petersburg, you will say, ah, you'll go to Paris, you'll say, mm. this is what you experience. Why? Because you saw something. Not because you, someone told you something about it. No, you go to Niagara, you don't need to listen story about now in Niagara waterfall. You just look and you're full of emotion. You go to Paris, you just look and you understand everything. We are able to understand by looking. We are able, nature taught us to do it. We are able to find our loved ones by looking, not by listening. We are able to understand who is our enemy by just by one look. Nature taught us, animals knows. Animals in jungle or in savannah, they look and they immediately know, oops, this is animal, and this is enemy. Or, oh, this is friend. They know and we know. So filmmaking is, a, it's a powerful tool, very close to nature of human because we don't need stories. If you need story, read books, write books. Cinema is to impress you with images you don't, you are not able to see yourself. So, and this is why if you make it exist, you know, we have different eyes and we can see something what normal people cannot see. And then you need to be pro to execute it well, <laughs> but this is already second, secondary. Um, I do want to ask a couple more questions and nearing the documentary, uh, the last two questions are of course centered around Gunda. And I just had a question about whether um, the section with the pigs, um, it was a constant throughout the documentary. And I was wondering whether that was meant to show either a coming, coming of age story for the piglets or just a depiction of what Gunda is forced to endure over and over again with being impregnated and then giving birth and having her babies taken from her. Um, it seems like that wasn't the first experience for her. Yeah, before, before before this period, she was already four times pregnant. And I believe after filming here, she was two more time pregnant. But then, then when she became famous and New York Times wrote about her and Wall Street Journal wrote about her and Guardian wrote about her, then, then the owner of the farm said, okay, she's gonna live until end of her days and she's gonna be retired. So now she's retired and, and we visit her actually sometimes. Time to time, one of us 
goes there and someone someone who has time goes there and sometimes one person sometimes another person sometimes we go by few people together we go to her and she know she recognizes and she runs towards us and even even le one leg chicken is still alive and she also recognizes us and she also it's amazing feeling you know when you come and she runs to you with one leg and um, yeah this amazing 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 feelings oh yeah yeah how how are we blind? I don't know. Listen, how we can be so blind in a way, right? That we don't understand the simple things. I remember my my I, I, I said many many times already the story, but I will tell you again because um, I was three probably years old. This is just what I remember about myself. And I was in the street with my mom, and we were just passing the bush, a little bush. And, and I cut out a little leaf. And my mom said, why did you do that? And I said, oh, look how beautiful it is. And my mom said, oh, just take one hair and cut it from yourself. Is it painful? Yeah, it is painful. So the bush feels the same. It is painful for you and for him, for, for, the, for the bush. Don't do it anymore. I guess, I guess we have to, you know what we do? I, it's probably something different from, but what we do now in, what we do is, you have kids, right? And age two or three or even before they go to kindergarten, right? And they spend all day with someone else, someone else. And then we meet them in the evening, a couple of hours before they go to sleep. And then next day they experience again, new life discovering the world with someone else. We even don't know with whom. And then they go to kindergarten, to schools. They, they go to school and they experience everything, like cruelty, jealousy, competition, um, insulting, everything, 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 without us. Without us. And on the top of it, we don't even teach them true, true experience of life. We don't even tell them that what we eat is wrong. We kill. We just kill the other day. We don't even tell them. For example, we are buying Christmas tea, right? I live in Berlin, beautiful country one of the best country in the world. 20 of December, all Berliners buying the Christmas tree. It's about a million Christmas tree in Berlin. First of January, Christmas trees on the street. So, we are buying them for 10 days. And then million trees, one month, rolling on the street. I don't know, in Germany, they don't collect them immediately. They, during January, one month, there are all these Christmas trees, just rolling by wind. All city. Million Christmas trees just for our pleasure, just for our fantasy, mythology, which we don't even believe. No one believes that Christus was born without penetration. No one believes, but we know that he, it was, it's not possible, right? 
But we do it. We do it. So we, we agree for our fantasy, for fake ideas, mythology. We agree to kill one million trees in one city. <laughs> then we can say, oh, but we grow them for this. Of course we can say. And this is what we do, right? We grow to kill. Enjoy. That's what I can say, enjoy. Yeah, I um, definitely agree with your mindset. I do not really celebrate Christmas anyway. And I definitely, I if someone's asking me, well, aren't you gonna get a tree? I'm just like, I don't want a dead tree in my home. I would rather see it where it belongs. And it's the same with my, my uh, partner where we go hiking and uh, they'll want to uh, pick a flower for me. And I'm like, well, it's beautiful, but if you pick it, then you've killed it. Now then you kill it, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. Better to just look and enjoy it and be happy that it exists, but not to cut it, not to kill it. But it's so far, it's so far before people will understand it. Yeah. Um, so my last question is, uh, you mentioned that um, you get to see, you have seen Gunda since the end of yeah. the Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and how often have you been able to see her? And then um, also, if you're able to answer this question as well, um, how, what is your advice to people or what would you say to people who when they find out that Gunda has retired and she doesn't have to uh, be a part of that and be impregnated, lose her babies again, um, that she doesn't have to suffer through that anymore. When people who have watched your documentary hear that and they feel comfortable and they feel like, okay, everything is okay then because this pig who I've developed a connection with Gunda, she's safe. And uh, what would you say to, to people who feel that way after watching your film? Yeah, she is, she is. At least one pig is, uh, this film say one pig, but 1.5 billion every year we kill and no one cares. No one even think about them. We don't think about them. And we, it's, it's not only pigs, we are killing 66 billion last year, chickens, over 300 million cows, plus, uh, plus sheep, plus uh, uh, rabbits, plus donkey, oh, uh, um, turkey, plus ducks, plus fish. So it's just huge machine. Gunda, she will live until the end of her day, thanks God. But others who, I just can say, we can pretend we don't think we don't we don't know about it, but we know about it. We know about it, and I guess this is most damaging to live and to pretend you don't know. This is most damaging for your soul if you know but you pretend you don't know. You know that torturing exists, but you pretend you don't know. You know that killing exists, but you pretend, no, it's fine, it's fine. No, it's not fine, it exists, and we can stop it. We just have to stop it, and that's all. And especially, we don't need it. We don't need it. God, if you believe in God, God didn't make barbecue and grill, did not create it. You don't have nails like this, neither teeth like this. You don't have it. You don't have it. We don't need it. We can be peacefully live in harmony with everyone. I, it's so simple. I just feel sometimes I talk with walls, you know. I talk with Chinese walls, I'm sorry to say. I, I just, some countries still eat dogs. Some countries still eat dolphins. 
What is this? Okay, we were eating each other. We were, we have, we have slavery 200 years, less than 200 years ago in my country, for example, in, in America as well, not far. We still have question about, we still not find out that racism is wrong. We still have question about it, right? Absurd. And of course, we far away before we understand that any life, any life has to, any person, any person, doesn't matter human or not human, has right to be here if he is born. And he, he has rights or she has rights to be happy here. Doesn't matter if it's pig or, or butterfly or human. Thank you for your beautiful questions. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. you. Like a, it was like a talking to sister. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Victor. And Thank I you. really enjoyed this time. And I think that your documentary will definitely help people get at least one step closer to yeah, understanding I, animals. I hope so too. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thanks. You so. too.